Good morning, folks. How are we doing? You look good. This is Pastor Jason. He used to be here. <laughs> Welcome back. It's good to be back. You it's look well rested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. am. We had a great time. Honestly, it was like the goodness of God. As my wife and I just kept saying over and over again, it's like, man, God is so good. He's so good. Been good to us. So it was, it was wonderful. He and his wife been on vacation. On sabbatical, not vacation. Well, hopefully it was vacation. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Yeah. Last couple of months. And uh, we're good. To, it's glad to have you back. Yeah. And it's September 1st. School starts this week. Mm -hmm. All the parents said. Ooh. <laughs> I guess they're happy about that. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a great week. Um, we love it around here. Our hallways are going to be bursting with kids um, yes. this uh, Tuesday. And. Um, I know that everybody's gearing up, but summer's not over. And my wife tells me, don't say that. Summer's not over yet. <laughs> I'm excited about September, though. I like September. It's a great month. Yeah. Hey, the thing about life groups, um, yeah. there's a gathering Thursday night. If you're new uh, here or just kind of recently started attending or even considering, Thursday mm -hmm. night at what time? At you got your glasses on? Six o'clock, yeah. <laughs> no? Now, we're going to do a kickoff dinner, and uh, it's for anybody interested in being a part of a life group. So the life group leaders will be there if you want to meet. There's men's groups, women's groups, mixed groups, all kinds um, that you kind of saw on the video, but it's here this, um, this Thursday. Is yep, it, is at 6 to 7.30. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that just as if I was 18. Yeah. It's in our fellowship hall right next door, and everybody's welcome. And the men's retreat's coming up two weekends from this weekend. Camp Tadmore, got a bunch of guys signed up. It's going to be great. So. And while I was gone, you started a sermon series about lies. Telling He's lies. Lying. <clears throat> the truth about yeah. lies is the name of it. If you knew, it's a, like week five, I think, we're in. And what we're doing is we're just sort of picking on, so to speak, we're picking out <laughs> Um, things that are sort of almost thought of as just the gospel truth, but when you really begin to take them apart, you realize, oh, there's some flaws in that. Let, let, let us tell you why, again, another reason may, maybe why we're doing it is, um, you know, um, just not too long ago, 50 years ago, I know that sounds like a long time, depending on how old you are, but um, our culture, Western culture, was framed by what people called um, absolute truths, truths that most people believed, truth that formed certain um, foundations in, in, in the segments of society, and they functioned that way. It was like the glue that held things together. In the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, that has been under assault, and the thing we hear today is the lie we're addressing today, which is, hey, you just follow your truth. You follow your truth. Whatever is true for you, you do you. Or whatever, you know, we hear different forms of it. The heart wants what the heart wants and, and things like that. But what we have to be honest about is it doesn't seem to be producing a better society. You think about just certain segments of, of, of our society, like, say, the education system. Imagine if in a classroom situation, those of you who are starting to teach this, uh, this coming week, if everybody just wanted to do them. You know, oh, I just want to do me. Imagine what kind of classroom environment that's going to be. Imagine the military, law enforcement. Imagine just a college a football team. If everybody just wanted to do themselves, just I'm going to be me here. You see that it rapidly starts to fall apart, and they're never going to win any games. I always wish that was true of spelling, because I'm a terrible, terrible speller. So you're just going to do you. Yeah, I always wish, like, why can't I just spell the way I want to spell, and you spell the way you want to spell, but that, then we don't understand one another. And that's what, <laughs> what, what, I know it's sad, but true, it's actually dyslexia is what it is. Uh, but what makes it a, a culture is, oh, we, we, the majority of us agree upon this truth. There might be a few within the culture, like, hey, they disagree, but they're still a part of this culture. But to be a culture, you have to agree upon certain things and say, yes, this is what we, we hold to be self-evident, we'd even say in our founding documents. There are some things that are just self-evident. We no longer see things as self-evident, do we? Now, now we decide for ourselves what is true and what is not true. You ever have, have a favorite lie? You have any favorite lies? I know you do. You won't raise your hand because you're in church and you're afraid it's a trap. But I know you got favorite lies. I got one I've been practicing for the last two months, and that is uh, calories on vacation don't count. 
<laughs> right? Who would agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. look at that. You yeah. got a following right here. Yeah, it doesn't count. Pastor on vacation, Jason's starting it's a fine. cult. Yeah, and it shows. I'm paying for that lie right now. But, but you know, that's, that's all, you know, funny and good. Like, if you drink a Diet Coke with your burger, then they cancel one another out. That, that's fun, that's, but it's not true. But when it comes into deeper things, like, what is your origin? Who are you? What is your identity? If you just make that up on your own, it's not funny anymore. It starts to become, and the culture starts to tear apart at the seams. Would you just pause as we open the Word? And I realize that we're, we're going to try to be concise and not drift and pray you can go with us here. As we just look at it, something that Jesus said, that Jen just read, and, and really just let it speak to us. Father, as we look in your word, we bow before your word. We stop before your word. We pause. Even as, as we pray, God, we say no to our devices. We say no to the feed that beckons us. We say no to what's on for lunch. We say no to a hundred things here in just this short period of time so that we can just hear what you're saying to us. We can walk out of here with something that makes us better image bearers. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, Jen just read to us from John Jesus' prayer that we would be in the world but not of the world, and that we would be sanctified by His truth. So we need to kind of think about that question, what is the world? What is the thing that we're in but not of, that we live in but we're somehow to be separate from? And there's, there's actually, biblically, there's not really just one answer to that question because the word world is used in a few different ways. And the, the first way we want to look at it is this way. In 1 John 2, 16 and 17, it says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What's, what's being said here? What is the, the truth that's being said here? The word, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you got it. The word, world is like, it's a word that used in different ways at different times. So that, does he, is he saying that everything in the world is awful? Mm -hmm. Could it be that, you know, nachos are of the world <laughs> when they feel so good? It, but that's really not. So here, look at Romans 1.20. It says, the invisible structures, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So what he's describing here is this, the creation of the world we live in, the globe we have residence on, the beauty. The world here is God's canvas in the context. His beauty is seen in, the, in creation. The heavens and the earth declare the glory of God. Everything that God has made. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like God's, again, vehicle to show us beauty. And, it's, it, and, it, and it is beautiful. But the, the word in the Greek is cosmos. It's, it's, it's more than just the globe. It's more than a physical thing you can tactile touch. It's, it's actually, um, it's more than that. But it can get specific too. You can narrow down what this means into another definition. And that is found in John 3.16, which we all learned in Sunday school, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When he's saying that, he's, he's not just talking about the cosmos, all of his creation. He's specifically talking about fallen man, right? The stars didn't fall. They stayed in their place. But man fell, and he came to, he loves man so much. But here he calls the, all the mass of humanity, he calls it the world. But here's the rub for today. Here's what Jen read. I want to just read it again. Because now he's not talking about the globe. He's not talking about just um, the mass of humanity. He's talking about something that we want to unpack this morning. I've given them your word, John 17, and the, and the world has hated them. So there's this, in, in just in that statement, you see this tension. I gave them your word. Jesus is praying for you and I. And the world has hated them. And it says... Just because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then Jesus prays, I don't ask that you take them out of the cosmos, but you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus is actually saying, praying to his father, Father, this world, this system is antagonistic towards us and them because they're with me. And I don't ask that you remove them. I just ask that you protect them while they're in it. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. 
And as you've sent me into the world, just like Taylor just said, so I'm going to send them into the world. That's what Pastor Taylor was promoting here. What we'd like to do with City Quake is to help us be trained to interact with a broken, fallen world without being obnoxious people, by being sons and daughters of God. I like that last part, and I think it's incredibly important because in but not of can feel like, well, he, he came and he made us kind of otherworldly, but then he left, and now we're just left behind. But we're not left behind, we're sent. Sent is very different. We're not abandoned. Matter of fact, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we're sent into the world. So he didn't want to take the salt out of the world. He wanted to leave the salt in the world, salt to preserve, salt to save. So we have a purpose for being here, but we're not to participate in the same things that the world participates in because we're from a different kingdom. And you've un- I think we've all experienced that if you've ever gone to another uh, place on vacation. Yep. And maybe it was a lovely place. It was a cruise ship that landed in somewhere on the West Coast and you disembarked and you walked into this town where everybody was speaking a different language and you didn't know the customs, but they were trying to sell you something. And, but you were wondering, Let's, what's really going on here? It's clear, I, I, I'm not from here. I'm not from this place. So I need to be an observer. I need to figure out how to fit in if you want to fit in. But then we've been in places where you feel the, the tension and you don't want to fit in. You're on the bad side of town. And you're like kind of watching your back and you're like uncomfortable because this isn't your, your territory, right? You feel like there's some kind of animosity. There's people watching me and I'm not sure they want my best, they have my best interests at heart. This is what Jesus is describing. I've left you in a place that doesn't like you. <laughs> and they, you know why they don't like you? Not you, it's actually me. They don't like me. You know why they don't like me? Because they don't like truth. Now, I'm not picking on anything in particular at this moment, but we we have to wrap our minds around this, that the tension we feel is because there are two kingdoms living simultaneously right next to each other, sometimes like right next to each other, and we're operating in both of those kingdoms at the same time. And this is tricky because uh, there are some people who are just disagreeable. Have you ever just met disagreeable people? They're just, they like to, they like to not get along. They like to always be contrary, but that's not most people. Most people kind of want to be liked. Don't you? Do you want to be liked? I kind of like being liked. I don't like being disliked. And he's specifically said here, oh yeah, you're going to be hated by the way. Like, oh, great. That'll be fun. They're going to hate me. So as long as I live by your laws, then I'm going to be contrary to the world, but I'm going to be in the world. And I'm, there's going to be times that I'm, I'm disliked. And so we kind of have to just settle into that and be a little bit okay with it. That there are some opinions that we're going to have because they're God's opinions that are going to be disagreeable with people. They're not going to care for those opinions. Now, that doesn't mean we're to be disagreeable or, or at our core just unlikable. Because Jesus, this is super interesting, isn't it? No one was more truthful than Jesus ever in all of humanity. And yet people were drawn to him. In fact, the most broken people were the most drawn to him. The most religious people tended to not get along with him so well. But broken people were moved towards him. I find that fascinating. And so I, I think there's a part of this, like, we're st- I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure out, like, God, what does it mean to be in the world but not of the world, to, to live by a different set of laws that will sometimes aggravate people and yet be a light that is also attractive to broken people? So Jesus is warning. He's, he's like putting us on notice. Listen, if they hated you, they're going to hate me. Now, John Mark Comer in his book, Live No Lies, he has this definition of what we're talking about here in a nutshell of what does it mean? Because if you've been in church a long time, you probably have heard way back in the day, oh, you don't go to that movie because that's worldly. And you don't wear makeup because that's worldly. Or you don't do this because that's worldly. And I think our forefathers were just trying to keep us out of trouble maybe, and then maybe they had a little bit of it mixed up. But, but, But listen to this definition of this system. He says... The, the idea of worldly is a system of ideas, values, morals, practices, and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institu- institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of evil. Leave that up there. Take a picture if you like. We'll leave it up there for a second, but think about it. In the garden, Satan came to Eve and said these two things. Listen, You can be like God. You don't have to obey that. You can have that fruit. And then he redefined evil and said, it's not wrong and you're not going to die. 
You hear what Comer is saying and, and what we're reading here? The twin sins. One is rebellion. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be, I'll be the keeper of truth. And it's not bad. I mean, do we not hear that today? Oh, well, that's, that's bad for you, but it's not bad for me. It's not, don't, we have such a difficult time today calling evil, evil. In fact, you watch in mainstream media, they don't, they don't use the word very much. They don't, they've actually kind of sanitized the idea, like we can't call it evil, because that puts it in a very black and white category. If there's evil, there must be good, and if there's good, there must be a keeper of good, and, a, and so on and so forth. But do you hear what's going on here? It's a lie that's as old as the garden itself. Secular, on the other hand, secular is not overtly or specifically religious. This is a, you know, just a this is Webster definition of, yeah. Not overtly, specifically religious, not bound by monastic, monastic vows or rules. So I'm not, I'm not bound by, look, there's a sacred over here, but I'm not bound by it. And, and we used to agree like, oh yeah, we are bound by something bigger than, our, than ourselves. There's something outside of us that is more important than us. There's something outside of us that is eternal. And, and we, as a culture, agree on this. But now we've, we've moved towards more of a, a, a pagan way of seeing the world, that there are a lot of different truths, and within each one of us is a truth, and I'm going to be true to that that I see inside of me. This idea of, 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 of monastic is like, this, this idea is like, oh, that's your narrow world. That's your narrow idea. I was talking to a good friend this, this last week who, who was trying to bring the gospel into a government sort of a structure. And he was told, no, no, that's, that's religious. This world here, this government world that you want to operate in, this is secular. And you have to keep the lines straight. That's what we're being told. That's what's being pushed. Like, this is secular. This is sacred. And it's a narrow world that you're speaking of. Now, listen, lies, three things. One is lies are infectious. Lies are infectious and they're contagious. Have you, ever, have you ever had an idea affect your behavior like, and you almost couldn't help it? Like when somebody in the house says, I'm just going to make a little bowl of popcorn. You're like, okay, that's fine. And once it starts popping, you're like, you know what? I think I'd like some popcorn too. Or you're on an airplane and you're fine when you got on. You were fine when you got on. You get in this long metal aluminum tube and someone like just one aisle up just starts coughing. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, man, I don't really feel that good. I mean, just like, I'm, you're, you know what I mean? You're just, what's going on right there? An idea has popped into your head based on a little bit of behavior, but now it's, it's like it's affecting you. It's, it's actually thinking, maybe I'm getting the flu. Maybe it's, maybe it's COVID. Maybe I should put a map. You know, it's all this stuff starts playing in our heads. Those two words are super interesting too. Infection is, it's, it's gotten in and it's starting to spoil. It's starting to take over, right? If, if you get a cut and it gets an infection, like, oh, I've got to pay attention to this. But contagious means it spreads. It goes from me to you. And, and lies do that. They spread. They go from person to person. And the reason why is because lies are appealing. They appeal to our feelings. It feels kind of good. There's something about it that appeals to us. Appealing and appealing to people's feelings is really the biggest business in the world. All marketing, all ads is about that. How can we, how can we find a, a feeling inside of you, and something that you want, and we can appeal to that desire? We can appeal to it. We can show you something. We say, this product will meet that need that you feel inside of you. And you will spend large amounts of money to try to meet that need. And so they don't, it doesn't even have to be true. They can tell a lie. If you buy this car, chicks will dig you. Mm -hmm. Right? If you drink this beer, if you, whatever it is, like, oh, well, it might be true. It's worth, I mean, what's the most I can lose? Getting drunk, I suppose. That's pretty bad. Uh, but, but I, they try to appeal, and so that happens all the time. Like, oh, I have this feeling, and, 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 and that, that, that makes me feel really good to believe that about myself. And then next thing you know, it's, it's spread from me to somebody else. Matter of fact, uh, you heard uh, the word viral. If you get something, go viral. Isn't that interesting that they use medical language to talk about an idea? It's an idea, but it's spread from person to person to person to person. Marketers know this. As a matter of fact, there's a, a saying, I, I got the quote down here somewhere, if you can make it trend, you can make it true. If you can make it trend, you can make it true. Isn't that crazy? That's why you hear politicians just repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
Even if they're caught in the lie, they'll just say it again, say it again, say it again, say it again. And eventually, like, well, he said it so many times, people just start to believe it. It starts to seem true. Isn't that, when you see that in action, I mean, did we, was there, did all the toilet paper factories really shut down during the pandemic? <laughs> I mean, right? Were we sort of moved to head to Costco before it ran out? If you can make it trend, you can make it true. That's what she said. She was writing a book on social. If you can make it trend, that's, isn't going viral the dream of every influencer? Yeah. Of everybody who's selling anything? Isn't the goal, isn't the dream, oh, if I can make it go viral? In other words, a whole bunch of people believe it, even though there may not be any data to back it up. It may not be true at all, but the, the majority couldn't be wrong, could they? You know, the answer might be, yes, they could be wrong. Well, how about this? How about the majority here? God's people, Judges 17. Here's the majority. Could they be wrong? In those eyes, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, excuse me, there was no king in Israel, and everyone, there's the majority, did what was right in their own eyes. This is Judges. This is like just post-superstars. Post Moses, Aaron, Joshua, promised land, Red Sea, plagues, deliverance. And all of a sudden, the majority is wrong. And everyone does what's right in their own eyes. This, is, I mean, this was written a long time ago. Human nature doesn't change much. In a, in a monarchy, the king was that thing that was outside of all of us, right? That we agreed on. Okay, the, the king is law. The king is law. What the king says is law. In a democracy, we've changed that. We said the law is king. The law is king. We no longer have a king. We've agreed upon a law. And we, the founder fathers tried to base that law upon God's laws. It wasn't perfect, but they, they agreed. Like, okay, there is a God. Because there is a God, there is right and wrong. And we can know right from wrong. So we're going to make laws. And those laws are going to live outside of us. And they will govern even our president. They will govern everything that we do. Because we believe there's an outside standard. After we've rejected that outside standard, though, now it's up to each individual to just do what's right in your own eyes. And now you've, you've lost cohesion. There's no glue that holds it together. And we've, we've lost our soul. Peter, the early church, one of the early church fathers, warned his followers, warned his bishops, warned his pastors. He said, listen, false prophets also arose among the people. Referring to past history, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Well, we need to listen. Listen. He said there are going to be teachers and people who come in and bring destructive heresies. A heresy is an untruth. A heresy is a challenge to truth. We talked last week about God helps those who help themselves. At its core, that's a heresy. That's a lie, but it's wrapped in something that feels good. Yeah, I need to, I need to do my bit. I need to, I need to help out. I need to, and, and again, there's a measure of truth in it. But at the end of the day, the gospel is for helpless people. It's for broken people. It's for people who cannot save themselves. He says they're going to bring in destructive heresies. And how will they do it? They will follow their sensuality and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. You hear the hook? The sensuality is the hook. You know, this just feels right. This feels good. Man, in the year that we find ourselves in, there are going to be people in the next few months that are going to appeal to our emotions. And the emotional lie is oftentimes the most powerful because it, it, just, it just seems so right. But it's just, it does, at its core, it could be so wrong. False prophet that they're talking about, false prophets are just liars. Liars that appeal to what you want to hear. Well, what do you want to be true? That's the prophecy, right? You go get your palm read. Oh, you, you single? Yeah. Oh, I see marriage in your future. <laughs> oh, isn't that nice, <laughs> right? I, I know what you want to hear, and so I say it, and then you'll come back and pay me a little bit more every time because it feels good to be told that I, what I want to happen is what's going to happen. But this also leads to, there's just this rebellion. I disagree with God. I don't, I, there's what God says, but I, I disagree with it. And rebels never like to be alone. Rebels always gather community around themselves. 
I've seen it many times. Mm. I've seen it on like missions outreaches. I've seen it in churches. I've seen it in business organizations. No one's content to be rebellious alone. They always draw people to themselves. Man, you can watch that. A rebel, someone in rebellion, is a potential leader that's gone bad. Mm-hmm. That says, I'm going to be in charge now. And there may not be. Some are overtly rebellious and some are subtly rebellious. It's hallway conversations and it's, it's just a little bit here and a little bit there. Hey, I just want you to pray with me about something. I, I, just, I feel like God is speaking to me. Gosh, I tell you, in the, in the decades in ministry, I've just seen this over and over. They mean well at the beginning, but somehow they've been seduced into something. So here's the second one. Times have changed, but lies have not. That's a curious thought. Times have changed, but lies have not. Listen to the lie that was in the garden. Remember the lie that was in the garden? The woman saw the tree was good for food, delightful to the eyes, desired to make one wise. She took it, ate it. She gave it to her husband. He ate. What is he, what's going on right there? Remember the scripture we read earlier? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. The pride of life. The lust of the flesh. It's good for food. Hey, Eve, it's good for food. Have you ever, have you ever been super, super hungry and you just like eat stuff and later you go, I'm not sure why I ate that. Taco Bell. <laughs> the one, that's their business model. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the free samples of the wontons, shrimp wontons at Costco. And then you, so you come home with a couple boxes of them and you're like, and then you cook them at home. You're like, I'm not sure why these tasted so good when I was walking through Costco because I was hungry. So the lust of the flesh, the, our enemy plays, the part of the lie is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play to your hungers. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with hunger. That's just part of who we are. That's part of our limitations. But our enemy sees it. That's where the, you know, we get the word, oh, well, I'm hangry. What is hangry? Hangry is feed me or you're going to see a, a time bomb go off, right? There's an emotional thing. What does that have to do with your stomach? It has everything to do because of the way we're designed. The lust of the eyes. It was pleasing to the eye. God has designed us with an eye gate. That eye gate, man, what comes through there is somehow transmitted and transferred into thoughts and brain and all kinds of activity. That's why, that's why porn is so expensive and red Corvettes sell like hotcakes. Because it, it, it's just so... It's appealing to the eye. And we were designed to be people who enjoy things through the eye gate. And the enemy plays on that. And it says, the pride of life. Listen, you're not going to die. Desirable for gaining wisdom. Hey, Eve, you want to be wise, don't you? The lies have not changed. Just maybe the context a little bit. The devil plays the same from the same deck every time. He he did the same thing with with Jesus. Jesus was fasting in the wilderness. And in, in that spiritual moment of fasting, when the flesh is weak, he appears to him. And, and what happens? This is, this is Matthew 4, verse 2. After fasting 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry. Of course he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, because he's just like us. He's hungry. He's just like us in every way, except without sin. So he answers, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm. Well, I've got a couple more tricks up my sleeve. Lust of the eyes. How about, how about you worship me and I'll give you the kingdom? He takes him up to a high place and he shows him all the kings of the world. Remember, what did Jesus, what did the Father love? For God so loved the world. So what has he shown? The world. Hey, here's the very thing that you came to save and I can give it to you. But without that price tag that your father's asking of your life, that's crazy. All I'm asking is you bend a knee. Bending a knee and dying on a cross, those are, I think I've got the much better deal. But again, Jesus without sins says, he will command his angels concern you. And Jesus says, on his hands, they will bear you up lest they strike foot against stone. Jesus, no. I'm not going to fall for this, this trick. It's, it's not just what I see or what fills my stomach. There's more to life than this. So finally, he tries the last thing. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. The truth is more than, sorry, I skipped one. The pride of life. Throw, throw yourself down, he says. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle, a temple. And look, the, over and over again, and, and the reality is it might be easy to see through now when we're sitting in church, but isn't it the very things that tend to make us stumble every time? <laughs> the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. 
If we aren't armed with the word of God, then we just stumble over and over and over again. We talked in the last couple of weeks about disordered desires. So what are we weak for when we're hungry? You know what I mean? That's like, I think that's a great question. Where, where, where does temptation come to me when I'm hungry? And I don't mean now just I, 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 wanna, I need a hamburger, kind of hungry. But when I'm emotionally hungry, you think about it. When I have daddy issues, what does a temptation look like in my life? When I have insecurity issues that rage inside of me, but man, on the outside, you'd never know because I've got this image. But what's feeding that? John Comer, Mark Comer, he makes this amazing statement. He said, your strongest desires may not be your deepest desires. Think about what he said. Your strongest desires. Like right now, I just want to just blow up. Right now, I'm just going to do that. Right now, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to click on this. And then after you click on it or after you blow up or after the mess is made, you say, that's not who I want to be. That's not me. You try to convince, that's not me. No, you don't understand. What's going on right there? Your, your strongest desire won the day. Your strongest desire got you to click, got you to take the bait. But afterwards there was remorse. But that's not who I am. That's your deepest desire. If you're trying to be a follower of Jesus. This is all of our lives, I think. We're like, I don't want to. This is what Paul said. He said in Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. He said, oh, wretched man am I. Who's going to deliver me from this body? Paul was describing, hey, sometimes my strongest desire is not my deepest desire. That's why coming into number three, I think, is part of the answer. Yeah, our final point is this. Truth is more than just information. Truth is a person. You can have, matter of fact, I, I know plenty of people that, that have the right information, but it's not transformed their life. They've got the facts straight, but they haven't embraced the person of Jesus. John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 8, 31, 32 says, Jesus said to the people who believed in Him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, you will know me, and the truth, I, will set you free. See, there's, there's, there, there's, a, there's a popular saying right now that um, I think uh, Ben Shapiro popularized. He said, uh, facts don't care about your feelings. It's really fun to say, right? It's really fun to say when, you know, people who are off and, and are wrong about things and, and, and are all worked up, but they're, they're wrong. And you just tell them, the facts don't care about your feelings. And you feel really good about it. <laughs> I've seen it on t-shirts, I've seen it on bumper stickers, I've seen it everywhere. And I don't disagree with it, it's absolutely right. The facts don't. But truth actually does. Because truth is a person. And truth, Jesus, loved the world so much that he was willing to sacrifice his life. Now, he doesn't care more about your feelings than your eternity. And so he, he will be willing to allow the truth to offend you in order to get you to a place of revelation and move you into salvation. But he cares deeply about you. He cares. So much so that he gave his only, his, his, his one life. The father cared enough to give, give his son. That says so much. The truth is personal. It's not something to be memorized. It's a person to be known. There's a popular term today, a movement called the New Atheists. This is like the rehashed version of the old atheists. It's just people that challenge the Word of God and, and, and science says this and so on and so forth. Richard Dawkins is one of those, an English intellectual. He said in a recent interview, not too long ago, last year I believe, he said, I deeply appreciate what Christianity has done to help us create a culture that we can enjoy. <laughs> He's just a hardcore atheist. What is he saying? I like, I like the facts, but I don't, want, I don't want to deal with the author. I like what it's produced. I see, that we, I see this all the time. People who say, well, I like what it produces. I, do you want someone to tell you the truth? Absolutely. You want someone who's going to be faithful to you? Absolutely. But behind it is the author of the idea. You're like, man, actually, 
that's a little bit of a stretch because he, he's got this thing with his cross and telling me to pick up my cross and follow him. That's not appealing. But Jesus won't have it both ways. He, he, he won't say, well, you can have my truth, but not because we just read there. He said, if, if you hold on to my teachings, if you remain faithful to my teachings, you're my disciple and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. He's not just saying the teachings detach from the teacher. It's this word there to know is this word that, um, that we would use in other places in the Bible to a, a man and a woman in intimacy. He said, you've got to be intimate with the teacher. Then you're going to know. Then you're going to be intimate with the truth. Then the truth will set you free. Jesus isn't saying like, hey, you, you can take, I mean, you just think about how, how foul that is in the context of, say, a man and a woman. Well, I just want you for certain things, but I don't want the whole thing. I just want a little bit of you that I want to enjoy, that I want my life to go better. We think about how revolting that is in the natural. And Jesus said, no, not me. Now, last passage, he says, listen, I'm not going to leave you alone, John 16, 15. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. He said, I'm, I'm going to send a Helper, the Spirit of truth. He proceeds from the Father, and he will bear witness about me. And you will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. That's us right here today. It's a spirit of truth. But it's not just some ethereal kind of foggy emotion. It's the person of God who's right, who can be right next to us that we can learn to hear his voice. Again, the, the, Pastor Taylor, what he's promoting here is this three-day weekend where we come together and we, we try to learn to hear God's voice. We hear God's voice in different ways. We're going to pick this up next week. We, we hear him in his word. We hear him by his spirit. We hear him in his people. We need all three of those things. But we don't just hear. We act on it. We act on it. That still, small voice. In your walk to know God, um, I have found, uh, you will know God only as much as you're willing to embrace truth. The truth about yourself and the truth about him. If you can face those two things, then you will know him deeply. If you reject either one of them, the truth about yourself or the truth about him, then it's, it's just lip service. Uh, in The Road Less Traveled, there's a quote that says, mental health is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs. <laughs> I like that. Mental health is the ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs. I think that that applies to the walk of the Spirit. The health of my relationship with God depends on whether or not I'm willing to embrace reality at all costs. We finish every week in the series with this. We call it the IRA. One is information. And the information we've tried to hand out today is this world we live in, that we call secular, is cut loose from biblical and historical truths. We don't live, I believe we, live, we are living in a post-Christian society. Some people would even believe it's a pre-Christian society. We've drifted so far that it's a brand new day as far as the Christian faith. We're talking to people, we talk to people many times that say, never heard anything, never read the Bible in my life. I was talking to a lady here just last week. Nope, my whole never heard any of it. We're living in a post-Christian society at best. And, but the thing is, everyone today is not saying, I just, it's not that I just want you to agree with my truth. I want you to celebrate my truth. There is a big leap from just agreeing to celebrating. And that's what you're seeing. You're going to see it more and more. No, no, you just can't say, well, okay, you can exist. I, I'll let you have that. No, I want you to celebrate with me. That's what's going on. The second thing is the reflection. Well, God, is there anything that I believe and practice that you want to conform to the Word of God? Are there areas in my life where I'm more influenced by the crowd? I mean, that's a tough question to ask, but am I, you know... The, the, you know, the wontons at Costco, that's a, that's a small step. Yeah, I got to admit, it was the smell and the line of people. I want to try that too. That's relatively harmless. But are there areas in my life where I find myself going with the crowd? God, is there something you'd want to say about that to me? Is there something you'd want to speak to me about? That final application, I just want us to think about it before we go to communion, and that's are there places in my life where Jesus is calling me to follow him that might challenge some ideas that I hold? And then the question then is, okay, 
will I follow Jesus or will I hold on to my own ideas? Am I willing to let go of and let die some ideas I have in order to follow? Truth. As we move to communion, that communion, the body and the blood is the, the facts of his love for us. It's just a fact. He died on a cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed for you. A lot of people know that fact. There are a few that reject it, but most historians don't, just all agree, like, oh yeah, there was a Jesus. He, he was crucified. But it's not enough to know the facts. Will they be internalized? Will I take them in? Will they take up residence inside of me? Will I allow that truth to transform and change my life? Just pause before we get up to pick up the elements with us. Would you just, just give this Holy Spirit that Jesus mentioned that he was going to send on our behalf just a second to speak to you. I don't know who it is in here this morning, but I feel like there's somebody here or somebody's here that you've been standing at the crossroads trying to decide, and this is your day. And God's saying to you, you're not going to understand it all, son or daughter of mine. You're, all your questions may not get answered. But I'm asking you to follow me. I'm asking you to trust me. You're here not by coincidence, not by accident. You're here this morning by God's design. And the elements we're about to pick up are these symbols of a God who is both holy and good. just and kind. That's the God who beckons you. We'll pick up the elements together and then we'll take when everyone is served.